again, we're so excited to uh, see you again. This is our, our annual update on Medicare and Medicaid. Lots of changes every year, and we want to keep you in the loop and in the know so you can make the best decisions for you and your family. So first, I'd like to just introduce my boss, Ronald Fatula, who is the founder and principal of Ronald Fatula and Associates. And just for many, many years, he's been such a leader in the industry. Um, the firm is parentally recognized as one of New York's top elder law and estate planning firms. And he has surrounded himself with uh, attorneys who were just like him. Maybe not quite as great, but uh, really great people who are very caring and very diligent about helping their clients. So the firm really concentrates on estate planning, Medicaid planning, special needs planning, wills and trusts, probate, guardianship, and guardianship litigation. As a, a certified elder law attorney, Mr. Fatula chaired the executive committee of the elder law section of the New York State Bar Association's Financial Planning and Investments Committee for many years. He recently chaired the board of the Alzheimer's Association Long Island Chapter and served as the executive counsel of AARP New York. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, one of the highest honors bestowed by the organization. Highly regarded for his advocacy in creating legislative initiative for the New York State Uniform Adult Guardianship Act, he lectures frequently on aging, elder law, estate planning, and he's appeared on numerous television and radio programs and frequently quoted in the New York Times, Newsday, Wall Street Journal, and the New York Law Journal and Kiplinger's. He's been honored by many organizations for his achievements and contributions to the senior community and for 17 years is a best lawyer and a super lawyer in New York. And also, I'm very proud to um, tell you about Mitchell Staub. We've worked with Mitchell for several years. He is the president um, and founder of MPS Advantage Group. As president and founder, he strives to educate and serve the community through Medicare education and planning. He's been working in this field since 2006. And prior to Medicare, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in South America, as well as a special education teacher. He's the loving father of a set of twins, and he's been married to his beautiful wife, Stephanie, for 15 years. In his spare time, which he doesn't have much, he volunteers his time on the board of a nonprofit organization, and he's very active at the gym and playing other sports as well. So we're very excited to be working with him again tonight. So thank you, thank you Mitch. And I'm going to turn it over to you. You can share your screen. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, um, let's just get this. Just the way I want okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, yes, I am honored to be sharing the stage once again with uh, Ron and and Jackie. They're just I love working with them. It's a, it's a great office, and you know I've I've uh, Ron is always doing the right thing for my clients. He is very sharp in his field and extremely uh, high level of integrity, and I never have a second thought about um, referring any of my clients to the office. So thank you so much for being a partner. And I am always excited to work with you guys. So what I want to cover tonight, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are aware. Um, I'm not sure if people in the audience are on Medicare. Maybe some people are coming on to Medicare soon. Maybe you're working and not sure um, whether they come on to Medicare or not. So I'm going to kind of give a broad stroke on Medicare, uh, what I do and the options that are available with Medicare and, and talk a little bit about if you're leaving an employer plan. But a big thing right now is obviously, I'm sure, like, like I was saying, a lot of you are aware, we, we're in the middle of open enrollment, okay? Annual open enrollment stretches from October 15th through December 7th. So we're about, you know, two and a half, three weeks into open enrollment, and you have until December 7th to reevaluate your plan, check your prescriptions, check your doctors, making sure that your benefits, that you're taking advantage of the benefits that you're eligible for um, come January. So that's what 
And that's what this time period is for. Um, some people in the audience might have gotten a letter. I don't want to name specific insurance companies, but some companies are not renewing some plans come January. You want to make sure you're aware of that. If you're not sure, you can reach me at my information that's that's on the uh, screen. And I'll put my information in the chat as well. But you want to make sure your plan is going to be there in January and you have coverage. Most plans are, but there is a little bit of um, kind of movement in the industry. And there's been some plans that are not renewing. So they've sent letters, but you just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, cause nobody wants to be come, you don't want to come January, you don't want January to come and, you know, your coverage isn't there. So if you're not sure, please don't hesitate to, to contact me. So like Jackie said, just briefly, you know, who am I? Uh, I'm a, you know, it's MP, I'm a founder president of MPS Advantage Group. Um, I've been in the insurance and financial services industry since 2004. Previously worked for MetLife in New York City as well as a couple of doctor-driven healthcare organizations. And since 2006, I've been uh, focused in Medicare education planning. I love doing it. I really enjoy working with the population. Um, it's a lot of, like it says, a lot of education. Um, you know, I do get compensated for enrolling people, but it's a lot of education. It's a lot of, um, you know, looking out for people, being an advocate, I like to say. And, um, you know, I take the healthcare industry seriously and I want to make sure people understand what's out there. And, you know, there's a lot of obvious, you know, uh, misinformation on TV commercials and mailers, and you want to make sure you're getting the right information. So, you know, working with myself or any other type of independent broker is going to really provide you with the best service. Um, and that's a picture of my, my wife, Stephanie, who's a special education teacher as well, and a trainer, healthcare Mitch, trainer. Mitch, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We can't see your slides. We can only see the whiteboard. Oh, oh really? The slides aren't open. Huh. It says you're... There right. we go. Now, what do you... Maybe... So, click on... Um... There you go. Now we can see it. You're oh. good. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So... There's my wife and my my twins. Um, so Stephanie, like I was saying, she's you know special education teacher as well, trainer, healthcare trainer, and I I have a set of boy girl twins. Okay, let's get into the um, get into the exciting things. Okay, so working with an independent agency, like I was just saying. Okay, so if you're going to enroll in a Medicare plan, you're going to look to change your Medicare plan. You know, you can call directly to one of the companies, or you can work with an independent agency. So again, I love and I enjoy and I'm very pro being a, being an independent agent. Why? Well, the first thing is I have access to several different carriers, you know, so I'm going to do what's best for you. I'm only able to survive and grow my business if I do the right thing for people. So I don't work for an insurance company. I always tell my clients I work for you. So I'm going to help you navigate through the maze of the plans and and figure out which option works best for you based on you know your needs um the insurance company compensates agents so i get i get questioned often how much do i pay you what's your fee there's never a fee to work with someone like myself or any agent okay if i sit with you for an hour or we have a phone conversation or a zoom call and nothing comes of it that's just what i do that's fine um, so there's never a, a fee to work with a, a Medicare agent such as myself. It's the same price. If you purchase it from me or you go directly to AARP or whomever, the price is the price. If, if you purchase it from a, somebody in Florida or somebody local here, it's the same price. It's, it's set. Okay. But again, I find the best plan type and then company. We'll look at the plan types a little bit tonight. Call to review questions during the first of many government acronyms, AEP, which is Annual Enrollment Period. You know, that's what we're in right now. Again, October 15th through December 7th. You know, I've we've reached out to all of our clients August, September, and now we're going through questions and helping people find new plans. And then new people are also calling and they need to find a new plan. And then I'm here throughout the year. You know, this is full-time you know, job, it's not just during open enrollment. So I, I'm enrolling people all throughout the year, people that are turning 65, people that move into the state for other reasons, people can enroll throughout the year, you know, and I'm here, clients have questions pop up in the middle of the year, you call me, you call the office. If you have a bill, if you have a claim, if you're not sure about a benefit, 
Uh, doctor leaves a network suddenly. You know, you contact me directly. I'm here to help. So a little history, you know, Medicare, you know, at the beginning, average person retiring was male. Average life expectancy was 68. 19 million people signed up that first year. Okay. You got Lyndon Johnson, Harry Truman right there. Um, the first Medicare claim. This is a Medicare card. Um, again, if you're on Medicare, you, you've seen this. If you're not on Medicare yet, it's now the last few years. It's an alphanumeric number. No more social security numbers. And we'll talk a little more about A and B. Okay, so I've adjusted everything for 2024. So just generally speaking, what does parts A and B cover? Okay, there's hospital part A, there's hospital care, skilled nursing, short-term nursing, and the list is there. Then part B, there's other things. You're welcome to Medicare, wellness visit, lab tests, uh, medical equipment. So these things are covered, but they're not covered always at 100%. So there's different, and we're going to talk about there's different gaps that you want to fill in to make sure you have these things covered for you as full as possible. And then what does part A and B not cover? Okay. Um, again, this is with original Medicare, annual physical exams, except for a one-time welcome to Medicare exam, long-term nursing care for more than 100 days, acupuncture, routine foot care, cosmetic surgery, hearing aids, dental. And we're going to talk about how to get things such as hearing aids and dental. Okay. So these are, um, again, these are adjusted. These prices just came out a couple of weeks ago. So these are the 2024 prices um, and rates. Um, so you'll see, I highlight in green what these gaps are. And we're gonna talk about you know, how to fill in these gaps. Because again, the Medicare, the A and the B that you get on the red, white, and blue card, that's original Medicare, but you need to have something to work in addition with that in order to give you full coverage. So the first thing is part A premium. Most people do not pay for Part A. You've worked at least 10 years or 40 quarters, okay? If you've worked less than that, as it says in the slide there, there is a prorated amount you might have to pay. Um, spouses can also take quarters from their other spouse, from their spouse, <laughs> if someone hasn't worked in the uh, in the country for 10 years, 40 quarters. Uh, so the first part is Part A. That's hospitalization. Hospital inpatient, deductible, and co-pays. So this first green gap, is not something you're gonna pay, you're going to pay because you're gonna have some type of plan that's gonna come in and pick up the gap. It's either gonna be a private plan, someone like myself can help you with, or you're gonna have an employer plan, a retiree plan. Maybe you're still working past 65 and they're paying this for you. But the first one is a $1,632 deductible. As you can see from the current year, it's gonna go up in January, about $32. And that is, the hospital deductible that covers you for days one um, through 60 in the hospital. Okay. And then it goes on to a copay if, God forbid, you're in the hospital longer than that in 60 consecutive days. So that's the first gap you want to shift away from yourself. Okay. Part B premium. Everyone's paying this. Uh, it's 164.90 right now. Could be higher if you make a high, if you're on a higher income. I shouldn't say everyone's paying it. Maybe. If you're in the room and you get extra help from the state based on your income, Medicaid, the state is coming in there and paying that for you. But if not, then the standard premium is $164.90. Again, comes off the top of your Social Security check. Once it's going up about 6% to $174.70 come January. Then the Part B deductible and coinsurance. So this is another, these are two more gaps you want to shift away from yourself. You have $240 Part B deductible, which is you're going to pay the doctors, you know, Zwanger, you know, x-rays, blood work, lab, labs and such, um, chiropractor. This is $240 come January, was $226, in, $226 in, 2000, in the current year. Again, about a 6% increase. And after you meet that deductible, you have 20% that you need to pay. Medicare pays 80 and you pay 20%. So again, that 20% can get very, very expensive. There's no stop measure. There's no safety net, that 20%. So that can just continue to go on and on. So again, that's why that's in green. So you need to get that 20% and shift it away from you to an insurance company 
you need to also shift the $240 deductible away from yourself. And again, that's going to be done through a private company that I can help you find or your retiree plan or a um, if you're still working. Okay, so what are the choices? How do I fill in these gaps? Great question. So you have two options. All the stuff you see on TV, all the stuff you get in the mail, very overwhelming. There's only two options. Option one is a Medic Gap plan, also known as Medicare Supplement. I like to use the word Medic Gap. It's the one that's in red. So this is offered by private companies. And the important thing to realize here is that first, it fills in those gaps, those three green gaps we, I showed you, the deductible at the hospital and the deductible for Part B, as well as the 20%. It, keep, it also keeps Medicare primary. By Medicare being primary, it opens up very wide range of access for you across the state, across the country. And secondly, you purchase a standalone Part D plan. Once you come on to Medicare, meaning you turn on your Part B, you need to have drug coverage, Part D, or you will be penalized, okay, for life. Those are lifetime penalties. So Part D, you want to either um, acquire that from a private company that I can help you with, or again, a retiree plan, a work plan, a union plan, you know, maybe you work for the government, the city, you know, one of those plans, something has some one of those types of entities need to provide you with a Part D. So again, Medigap or the Medicare supplement, Medicare primary, insurance company secondary, and you also pick up a standalone Part D, okay? Option two is Medicare Advantage. This is the majority of the commercials and everything you're seeing on TV now. This also, these plans are known as Part C. They also fill in the gaps that Medicare does not cover. However, they provide to you reverse as compared to the Medicare supplement plan. So the Advantage plan puts the insurance company primary, Medicare secondary. Okay, as it says, it combines parts A and B. And most of the plans here in, in New York and the boroughs and upstate and even you know New Jersey, Connecticut, they cover prescription drug coverage as well. Okay, so you get your A and B coverage, Plus, you get prescription drug coverage all built into this is an all-inclusive package. So it all comes together, whereas the Medigap plan, the one in red, you get two cards. You get a Medigap plan, which helps for your medical and hospital, and then you get a separate Part D card. Okay? And those can be different companies, too, you use on option one. But the Medicare Advantage, it's all encompassed in one package. Aetna, Humana, WellCare, Health First, you know, Anthem, United Healthcare, they're all going to be... It's an, you get one card from those companies and you use that card for everything you need. All right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the Medicare supplements or Medigap plans. So I know it's a lot of, a lot of color, a lot of checks, a lot of letters. Um, the ones in green are the ones you want to focus on. F, G, N. Not at, we can, and again, offline, if you want to call or email, we can get more into detail. Like I just want to do a broad stroke. But, you know, these plans you pay a premium for. And then as you can see, um, the ones in green have the most checks, which means they're going to cover the most. So, you know, Plan F is no longer offered unless you were unless you're 65 prior to January of 2020. So after 2020, January 1st of 20, the most comprehensive letter you can buy is G followed by N. So as you can see, G, every every box is checked except the Part B deductible, which is 200 and $40 for January. Everything else is covered. Okay. You pay a premium for the letter. Okay. And then you pay, a, and then again, with these plans, you're also going to buy a drug plan. So you purchase the supplement, the Medigap, you pay a premium for that plan. And then you have a separate premium for your prescription plan, which is predicated based on your medications if you take any. Okay. Um, plan N, I wrote some notes on as that's a very popular plan here in New York. Um, it's almost the same as G, except for on the left here, you can say it, it, you can see after you meet the 220, the 240, excuse me, Part B deductible, there's a $20 copay to doctor and $50 copay at the emergency room. Other than that, it's the same as G. Things to know about New York specific New York is a community rate state. Plan premiums are not based on age or gender. So you're 65 or 95, male, female, same price, very unique. You go to New Jersey, different, male, female, you know, different ages. New York, it's not like it's not like that. 65-year-old is paying the same premium as an 85-year-old. We live in a guaranteed issue state. 
There was no underwriting. We decided to change and come back to a Medigap. This is also very unique to New York. There's a lot of things that you hear, and I hear from clients often that say, well, if I take a Medigap and then leave, I can never get it back. In New York, you can always get it back as long as you still have part A and B. No matter what happens to your health, there's no pre-existing, no health conditions. Okay? Other states, yes, you have to go through underwriting, and they can disqualify you. I, I have a license in some other states, and if clients want to change, we have to go through health questions, and sometimes I can't get them approved because their health has changed. New York, it's not like that. We're one of four states. So with all the issues we have here in New York, that's one very positive thing they they uh, provide for the people for uh, members of Medicare. Um, okay, and Medigap is guaranteed renewable; can't be canceled as long as you pay your premium. So now the Advantage plans. Okay, Part C. So the other way, remember Medicare Advantage plans have the insurance company primary, and Medicare secondary. So they come in a few different ways: HMO, PPO, PFFS. We'll focus on the middle one, PPO. We do. I do a lot of PPOs here in New York, preferred provider organization. The HMOs are around. They're good plans as well, but the PPOs are popular. There's never, there's no referrals. That you can go add a network, and they usually have a nice doctor network. And again, these plans include Part D Medicare prescription drug coverage. Okay, so as part of the Medicare Advantage prescription drug plan, all plans must meet minimum coverage levels set by Medicare. So some people are like, well, I join a Part C plan, I'm going to get less coverage than a Medigap. That's not true. The Medigap, the Medicare Advantage plans, they have to get approved every year and they have to meet a certain standard. Okay. The difference is way it's, the way it's delivered. Again, in this, in these uh, situations, the Advantage plans, the insurance company's primary. So you have to make sure your doctor takes the plan and Medicare. When you go to the Medigap plan, you just have to make sure your doctor takes Medicare. Okay. And then when an insurance company's primary, you know, they have a different rule sometimes. So it's just the way it's delivered to you. Um, but they have to cover things that are covered by Medicare and if they're medically necessary. Okay. Benefits included in Medicare Advantage plans, like we said, insurance company's primary. Most plans offer drug coverage included, as well as extra benefits. We see these increase every year. Dental, vision, healthy spending cards, OTC, over-the-counter, as well as a gym membership. We can talk about which plans have those if you're interested. May have lower out-of-pocket than original Medicare. Okay, There are maximum out-of-pockets on these Advantage plans, which protect you. Annual enrollment period, which we're in now. And then you do not have to have Medicare supplement. You only can have one plan. You choose either an Advantage plan, Part C, or a Medicare supplement. So how do I decide? Some people this time of the year are trying to figure out, well, maybe I'm in the wrong plan. Maybe I should look to a supplement. Or maybe I'm in a supplement and I'm paying too much and I should go to one of these Advantage plans I keep seeing on TV or I've heard about. My neighbor has, my friend has. So what's the current state of your health? And again, before I you know, get into this, I'm coming kind of close to the end here. I mean, every one situation is different. So I hear all the time, well, my friend, my neighbor, they said this plan's the best. I don't, play any, I don't pay anything and this and that. And they could be correct in a lot of things they're saying, but does that apply to you? Everyone has a different situation, different needs. Um, so what's the current state of your health, okay? How often do you visit your doctor or your specialist? Will the cost in monthly savings offset the potential copay? So one thing I might have uh, skipped over is that those Part C plans, the PPOs, they're zero premium. So most of them, if not all of them, you don't pay. You continue to pay Medicare, right, every month. However, for the plan itself, you do not pay. People ask all the time, how is this plan zero? What do you mean? What am I, what am I missing? Well, it's because the Medicare market, there's so many baby boomers still coming into the, the Medicare, Medicare market that these companies are getting so large, they're able to develop plans that have no premium. Um, where's my annual budget for healthcare? Okay, what am I trying to spend per month? You know, I don't want to you know, extend myself too much on healthcare premiums, not be able to travel and, and live my retirement as I like to. Are the added benefits more important to me? The dental, the vision, the gym. And then do I travel? Do you need services? Obviously, we have a lot of snowbirds around, you know, or maybe you go to Carolina or out west or upstate or wherever you go. Do I need doctors in another state, another area? Okay. Um, about three minutes left. Just want to... um. You know, this is just real quick. Should I stay or should I go? 
um, you know, common thing. If you're leaving your employer plan, if you're deciding what to do, these are some things that I look over with people to determine what's better. It might be better to stay with the employer plan. It might be better to come on to Medicare. We have to analyze, you know, apples to apples and see which plan is is uh, the most cost effective and gives you the most benefits. Okay, a lot of times I tell people to stay. Let's look at it next year. You know, if you have a good employer plan, you know, keep it. Um, okay, so these are, this is something I want to go over quick also. I don't know if anybody in the audience has seen IRMA, um, I-R-M-A-A. -A. Um, it's not my my late, it's not my first girlfriend from high school. Irma is actually um, social security assessment. They attach to higher wage earners. So these are the new income tables for 2024. So you'll get a letter from social security if you're going to get, if you're going to have to pay this. And what it, the, the thing to be aware of is it goes back two years. So as we're going to January, they look at your 2022, as it says in the bottom, modified adjusted income. Okay. And they're going to compare and they're going to look at your income. And if your income, for example, if you fall together, okay, and you're in the 206,001 to 258,000 as a joint uh, tax return, that second column there, the second row, excuse me, you're going to pay, you see it has the 17470, which is a new premium, plus 6990. You're going to pay a total of 24460. So in every row, it says 174.70. That's the standard. And then it adds on what your additional assessment would be. Okay. And there's also one for Part D. And it says in the last column. Now, if your income has changed in 2024 because you reduced your work hours, you retired, you can appeal this. So if this is a situation with, with yourself, let me know. Okay, there's ways to appeal it. And there's also ways to plan ahead to avoid this financially. So that's something else I have some uh, partners in my office that work on. But this is an important thing to be aware of. And be aware that Cognizant, that it's two-year look back. And you can appeal it if your situation has changed from when it was in 2022. All right? Uh, this I'm going to kind of skip over. This is just if you have an employer plan. And um, some things to be aware of if people are still working and they're not sure what to do. Uh, there are some pitfalls you want to avoid, and I can help you walk through those. Uh, things if you're the VA, <clears throat> the size of your employer, so on and so forth. Um, and that's it. This is actually the first time I think I've ever been under time. So um, just some things my office provides. Social Security plan, again, the IRMA planning, how to avoid that assessment attached to your Part B and Part D long-term care planning and you know we look forward to answering any questions and working with you and your family and and thank you i hope that wasn't too fast i try to get through a, a good amount of information in the time so uh you guys thank you all for your time and hope you all have a great evening and i look forward to answering any questions thank you mitch that was that was terrific appreciate it um uh, Okay, uh, so I guess I just start right in. So Mitch, that was terrific. And in fact, our Elder Law Review is on these new Medicare, uh, the new Medicare numbers uh, this year. And anybody that doesn't get our Elder Law Review, just shoot a, a, a chat or even a, an email uh, to Jackie, and she'll make sure that you're on our uh, mailing list. We do the Elder Law Review once a month. And uh, this month it was on Medicare, so uh, and for good reason because of the open enrollment, and we're smack dab in the middle of it. So I'm going to change uh, things up a little bit and talk about Medicaid. Uh, thank you, Mitch, for putting your uh, contact information in the chat. That's terrific. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about Medicaid a little bit. What's new? what's coming down the pike and uh, let's roll up our sleeves. I'm gonna talk for about 15, 20 minutes, just go over some uh, things that you should know. Uh, most, of the, most of the group here are people that uh, we don't know. So I'm gonna start from the beginning on most of this. No, in 15, 20 minutes, I can cover even the very basics of Medicaid but I'm going to try to cover the just the what you 
should know at least something you could leave this this talk with and say, you know, I picked up a good few points and that's important. And the reason I talk about Medicaid is that when you look at who pays for long-term care, that's care at home with a home health attendant, for example, or care in a nursing home, it's either private pay, Mitch men mentioned long-term care insurance, Medicare, but Medicare typically doesn't cover long-term care. I cover a little bit of nursing home care if there's a three-day hospital stay, but the max you're going to get per spell of illness is 100 days, the first 20 days in full, and then there's a pretty substantial copay for the last 80 days. Uh, and uh, you have to have a skilled care need. Bottom line, some people get it, most don't. But even if you get it, it's not long term. It's only for a couple of months. And that's it. So how do you pay for long term care? It's either privately and uh, nursing home care in our area, in the New York City, Long Island, Westchester metropolitan area happens to be about and it's hard to believe it, but it's about twenty thousand dollars a month. So most people can't private pay for an extended period of time. Medicare won't cover it long-term at all. Long-term care insurance does, but a lot of people don't have it. They don't plan in advance. They can't afford it. Uh, but if you can afford it, long-term care insurance you know, is a wonderful uh, way to pay for long-term care. Veterans benefits typically do not cover long-term care. The aid and attendance program has been watered down. But if you are a vet with close to 100% service-related disability and you need a nursing home, you might be able to get one of the VA homes for free. And that is certainly something to look at. Uh, to look into if God forbid you need that level of care. So that's why we talk about the Medicaid program. Some people rely on family caregivers uh, and that's great. And they even could be paid through the Medicaid program uh, with the, what we call the CDPAP program, this consumer directed program. So having family members take care of you might be a way to go. So we have a Medicaid managed long-term care uh, system. We call it MLTC here in New York. Uh, and enrollment in an, in an MLTC plan is mandatory if you're dual eligible. You're eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and you're over 21 and you need community-based care for more than 120 days. Like Mitch, I'm gonna be going through this a little bit quicker because of time constraints. We wanna leave time for questions. Uh, but I want you to know that there's been a law uh, on the books, actual law that says for New York State, Medicaid home care, there's a 30 month look back. And all along we thought that in 2021, 2022, 2023, now 2024, we thought that that look back was going to start. Now DOH is telling us it likely will not come down at least until the second quarter of 2025. So you have a little bit of leeway there. And they even said it might go into 2026. And one of the reasons is, well, there are two big reasons. Number one, New York State is not ready to do this look back. It takes a lot of individuals and planning to get this together. But on top of that, CMS, the federal agency that regulates Medicare and Medicaid for all the states, hasn't even approved the law yet. So... It's likely going to come down. We likely will have a 30-month look back, a two-and-a-half-year look back for Medicaid home care, but it won't happen, most likely, in 2024. 
likely sometime in 2025. So what does that mean? It means that if you need Medicaid home care and you have assets, you can transfer or gift those assets this month. We're in November of 2023. Gift them in this month and get down to the Medicaid asset level. It's about 30,000 for an individual. Then you'll be eligible. Let me give you an example. So the Medicaid level is 30,000 or so, 30,182. But let's round it up. 30,000. Let's say an individual has 300,000 in assets and wants to become eligible for Medicaid home care right away. Uh, they can just simply transfer 270,000, getting down to the 30,000 level and be eligible for Medicaid as of the first day of the next month. Let's say it's 500,000, 530,000. They could trans transfer 500,000, get down to the 30,000 Medicaid asset level and apply as of and get benefits. Uh, won't get benefits the first day of the next month. You're financially eligible. But if it's an immediate need, you'll get benefits pretty shortly thereafter. And there is no look back yet. Coming down the pike, but no look back yet. All right, uh, so let's do an overview. Uh, so you remember I just said that the Medicaid asset level for an individual is 30,000, 30,182. Uh, and uh, for Medicaid, uh, in Medic last year, by the way, the, the asset level was 16,800. Do not expect such a big increase this year. We anticipate it to be around three to 6%. Do not expect a big increase like we got last year, because last year they they devised a different formula. So it's going to be a couple of thousand more likely, and that's it. Come uh, January of 2024, the uh, spouse in the community or the well spouse can keep assets going up to about 148,000. Second bullet point: it's about. 148,620, uh, the way I calculate it, let's see how close I'm gonna come, but I calculate that the new level will, will be about 154,000 for that well spouse. If that well spouse has more assets and or more income, look at that fourth bullet point, that spouse could keep income, whether at home or in a nursing home of at least $3,715, that's going to go up a little bit uh, uh, as well. To, I, I mean, I'm going to imagine at least about $4,000 uh, in a couple of months. So not too terrible considering what we were dealing with just a year ago. So these are pretty good numbers. Uh, but I'm going to give you an example in about five minutes. Uh, you're going to say, well, nobody could make it on you know medicaid applicant uh, sorry medicaid recipient for home care can have about $1700 of income a month 1697 with a $20 disregard who could live on long island westchester new york city on 1700 bucks a month nobody but there are ways around it so i'm going to give you some examples so that you know medicaid planning is a viable alternative, not only to the lower class, but also the middle class. And that's the planning that we do quite a bit of. All we do in my office is Medicaid planning, estate planning, anybody high end, low end, we help everyone and special needs. That's what we do. We don't do anything else. Uh, you know, everything that's related to that. We do guardianships, probate, et cetera, but that's all related to what our clients need as they age. We don't do other anything other than the elder law, estate planning, and special needs. Um, so the applicant can keep around 30,000. The spouse, that's the well spouse, can keep up to about 148,000. The well spouse can keep at least income 
of 3715 in 2023, likely a little over 4000 in 2024, and the home care Medicaid recipient could keep around $1,700 of income a month. Now, uh, there is a five-year look back for Medicaid nursing home care. But again, no look back for home care. So if someone wants to apply for Medicaid home care, again, they could give away 100,000, 500,000, 600, could give away anything. They get down to the level and be eligible the first day of the next month. Not so for Medicaid nursing home care, where they look back five years. Okay. Uh, just a as a, a note, there's an opportunity to plan because we will be having a Medicaid look back for home care. We just don't have it yet. So if you know somebody that's saying, well, I could use Medicaid home care now, but I'm gonna wait, don't wait, because it's gonna be a look back. Right now is the time you should uh, apply or whenever you need it. But for Medicaid nursing home care, there is a look back and there is a Medicaid penalty. I have very little time to explain this in great depth, but let me just go to this slide and explain how to calculate. When someone is actually in the nursing home, gotta be in the nursing home for the look back to start. Someone's in the nursing home, their assets are under the Medicaid level, except you know, for the gifts. They're, they're under the Medicaid level. So they're in a nursing home under the Medicaid level and they apply for benefits. Medicaid looks back five years. They look back five years to see what assets the Medicaid applicant and the Medicaid spouse <clears throat> has and what they gave away as gifts. And for every $14,000, if you, if the applicant is from New York City or Long Island, you could see these figures. They're upstate. The number is going to be a little bit lower. But $14,000, for every $14,000 gifted, Medicaid will say, you could have covered yourself for one month with that $14,000. But instead, within the last five years, you made a gift. So we're going to penalize you for one month if you gave away $14,000 within that five-year look back. And if you gave away $28,000, I'm gonna say you could have paid for two months of long-term care, so we're gonna penalize you two months. Yeah, we are eligible for Medicaid nursing home care, but you gotta wait two months because you gave away two months worth of Medicaid long-term care expenses. What if someone transferred, the applicant or the spouse transferred 140,000? 140,000 divided by 14 is 10. It's gonna be a 10 month wait. And that's the way it works. So you wanna do your planning at least five years before you're gonna need Medicaid in a nursing home. And we're gonna get a Medicaid look back for home care. So you wanna do this planning five years in advance, but we don't know when we're gonna be, become sick or not. So the idea is to plan in advance so that the five-year look back could come, it could go, and your assets will be protected. I'm gonna give you an example just within a couple of minutes. Now that you know the rule, there's an exception to the rule. There are some gifts that are exempt such as gifts to a spouse, to a blind child, to a disabled child. You can get these slides and look that up. This, and you know, let me make it a little easier. Whoops, I didn't know we'd go back here, but like, just wanted to make it easier so you see this a little bit bigger. Sorry, I didn't do that before. So these are the exempt transfers, and you could read that later on. Uh, what about exempt transfers of the home? There are some to a spouse, a blind or disabled child, a minor child, 
to a brother or sister who's lived in the lived in the home for at least one year before institutionalization and to an adult caregiver child who's lived in the home for at least two years prior to going to a nursing home. Medicaid has a home equity limit of around 1,033,000. So uh, if you have a home that has that's valued, the equity value is under 1,033,000, and that's gonna go up, I think, fairly substantially next year, but uh, it's a, currently a million thirty-three thousand. Uh, that's exempt if you're getting Medicaid home care, and if you have an intent to return home, even for Medicaid nursing home care. Okay, best way to protect assets is with a Medicaid asset protection trust, uh, and the uh, advantage is that you get to live in your home. You get protection from creditors of your children. You get all sorts of tax advantages. You, you get a basis step up. So there's no, absolutely no capital gains taxes on that home. If you keep it until death in that trust, I don't care if you bought that home for $5,000 and now it's a million. And you also get the uh, $250,000 and the husband and wife get $500,000 capital gains tax exclusion, and the list goes on. You know, and you have control, et cetera. Pooled income trust is used if you have income over that $1,700 if you're getting Medicaid home care, and you can use that uh, for your uh, uh, care at home. I just want to give you an example uh, and let you know that this part of the slides, there's a lot of new things going on with how you're assessed for Medicaid home care. I don't have time to go into it tonight, but it's very interesting and I'm not very happy for my clients about it, uh, but uh, we do Medicaid applications. We have a very robust Medicaid application department and uh, we're there to help our clients go through the maze. And now it really is a maze and we have go through these, you know, it's, it seems to be like a maze to me, but this flow chart, uh, and at the end of the flow chart, unless we do fancy planning, you're likely not going to get the hours that you should get, but our clients typically do, uh, and there's a lot of advocating for that. So now I just want to talk about we'll just get to the very beginning. That's my contact information. Let me give you an example. Client walks into my office, middle class, to have 600,000 in uh, liquid assets, uh, 400,000 in IRAs, and they have a home valued at 700,000. So let's say 700,000 liquid assets, 700,000 for the home, and 300,000 retirement accounts. So that's a million seven in assets. And the client says, you're telling me with a million seven estate, I could do uh, Medicaid planning? I say, sure. What do we do with the retirement account, that 300,000? Keep it. I changed the law in New York State about it. Retirement accounts in payout status are exempt from Medicaid. You keep the 300,000. Make sure you have named beneficiaries and we're set. You know, simplifying it, just ever so slightly. What do we do with that $700,000 home that you bought 40 years ago for 10,000? We transfer that into the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And that home will be protected. You could live in it, it could be sold. You could do, you could do most anything, but have the house protected. What about that 700,000 liquid? Well, you know, I would have a conversation with my client. Uh, is there plenty of income? Can we protect most of that? Let's say the client says, you know, I, I, I have plenty of income, uh, but I want to protect these assets, but I don't want to put every penny in that trust. I feel comfortable putting in 500,000 out of my 700 non-IRA liquid assets. So he puts or she puts 500,000 
into the same Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So we now have 200,000 in the individual's names. We protected uh, a million, we protected 500,000, 800,000, and seven, a million five out of the million seven. And I wanna let you know that there's a way to protect about 50,000 right off the bat with the 30,000 plus purchasing pre-need agreements for yourself, a spouse and or family member, and then even half of the balance or around 75,000. So in my example, we protected a million seven, even if you needed care right away after that five year look back, there's only $75,000 that would not be protected unless we think of something else creative, which we often can. So that's my presentation. I wanna leave a few minutes for uh, questions for Mitch or myself. Uh, and Jackie, why don't you uh, take over? Thank you, Ron. And thank you, Mitch, for your both of your amazing presentations. We do not have any questions, uh, but that are actually typed into the Q and A. However, if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand, and I will allow you to speak. And you can just ask the the uh, panelists your questions directly. Does anybody have a question? And I want to tell you, I, I know that what I do is very complicated. And I know that even I have a lot of client, uh, a lot of questions for Mitch. Mitch really <laughs> knows what he's doing with, with this area. And uh, there are so many choices. So I'm surprised if nobody has a question. But that's OK. Uh, if you I know. just actually got a, <laughs> actually an, e an email. And it says, um, does the firm partner with any insurance agencies? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we don't partner, uh, but we can refer you to individuals regarding uh, insurance. But Mitch actually does quite a bit of this work. Mitch? Yes. Yeah, no, I, I've been working with Ron's office for a long time. And uh, yeah, we've worked hand in hand. Um, you know, and I've been able to assist a lot of his clients with questions uh, on how to utilize their benefits. There's a lot of specific things that arise with Ron's clients in particular that I've been able to assist and navigate. Like we said a few times, like the maze and try and figure out how to use your benefits and figure out the right plan to um, to assist in, um, you know, solving that need. So, uh, yes. And Rena Yashal. Um, I've unmuted you. You can go ahead and ask your question. Just already emailed the, uh, sent it in the Q and A, but we just made a revocable trust with your firm. Uh, we're both on Medicare. Uh, should we have done a Medicaid trust? I, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, we could take another look at it, but I'm sure if you needed a Medicaid trust, uh, we would have done that for you. Um, and uh, you could feel free to speak to the attorney that did it. Uh, we always work as a team. You could feel free to reach out to me, uh, someone in my office. You might as well go back to the attorney that handled it. But uh, I'm sure uh, if it was the right thing uh, to do for you, uh, we would have done it uh, because we we do both both every day of the week. Okay. Revocable, okay. irrevocable, and Medicaid trusts and estate planning trusts. We do them all the time. Well, while I have you here for a second, I just want to thank you from all of us young seniors for the amazing work you've done for all of us. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, we do try very hard. And uh, thank you for saying that, Rena. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I, we don't have any other questions. I know that Mitchell Staub is fully available for questions about what you need to do during open enrollment, as well as um, the, the upcoming year. There are changes, of course, every year in Medicare and Medicaid. So please reach out to Mitchell directly. Mitchell, you put your contact information in the chat. Yes. And as well, um, 
actually, I, we just got a couple of questions. So hang on a second. Um, how early in advance should a, thank you, Susan. How early in advance should a senior plan for a Medicaid trust begin? Well, uh, look, uh, I would say anyone, uh, you know, 50s and older should really start to think about that. And even younger, if you uh, have a diagnosis like an early onset uh, a dementia or there's an illness, a chronic illness. Uh, so uh, the reason I say that is you want to fund the trust five years before you have a need. And you don't know when you're going to have a, a, a need. Uh, we have the friend star that just died at, at what was he, 50? We have, and who else died at 54? There is a, uh, oh, a daytime actor. I think he was 54, just in the last yes. couple of days. Uh, so, you know, nothing is guaranteed in life. Uh, and every day is a gift. Uh, so, you know, the earlier that you plan, the better. You're not going to do it in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. But when you start to get into your 50s, you definitely want to start to uh, look into doing this type of planning. That's really a, a very, very good point, Ron, because it's just amazing how young people pass away and and it's unexpected. So that could happen to all of us. Right. Um, the other question is, what is the difference between a revocable and an irrevocable trust? A revocable trust is a trust that the creator, called the grantor or settlor, can revoke or amend at any time very easily. An irrevocable trust is a trust that can only be uh, uh, revoked or amended with the consent of the creator the trustee and the beneficiaries. However, the way we draft our irrevocable trusts make it very, very easy for most times for the creator to revoke it. So even though we draft irrevocable trusts like the Medicaid trust, which is irrevocable, uh, it usually can be revoked any time by the creator uh, with the provisions that we put into it. But that's the difference. Oh, Jackie, you're on mute. Okay. So William Lorber uh, has a question. L William, can you unmute? Uh, let me let me unmute you so you can ask your question. Make sure that you're. Can you unmute yourself, William? No. Let me. All right. Let me try to do this. The webinar is a little bit more complicated than a regular meeting. So let me find William. Okay. Okay, William, you can speak. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, it's really me, his wife, Anne. Um, we have a, a interesting situation with a house um, that's owned by three siblings. So what yeah. we... Um, it's very complicated. I'm not going to go into all that. But what was done with um, our portion of the house, which is a third, we, we all have a third, is um, a lawyer that we had gone to suggested um, that we put my, I put the third, my portion, into an Ann Lawberg trust that's irrevocable. Okay. I don't know if that's good, bad, not good, bad. But, uh, it depends. It depends on your situation and what's going on. It may not be a bad idea, you know, to do planning for yourself. I, is that a home that you live in? Is it your yes. primary residence? Yes. 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 My husband. What we live. Yes, we live in the house, and she she felt that it was necessary for 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 me to to protect the house. I guess, or my, the, you know, protect the house. I'm assuming, and that's why they she put the houses in the trust. Nothing else. It's just the house. Probably. I don't know about the rest, but because I don't know your circumstance. Right. So I can't really answer for sure. But uh, I will say that it's probably a very good idea that your one third share is in a Medicaid asset protection trust. But it, uh, it doesn't say Medicaid. It just 
it just says it's irrevocable. It just says Ann Lawberg trust, but so, I'm not sure if it's a Medicaid, what you're saying. Yeah, I guess I, that must I be I guess the somebody reason. would have to review it. Uh, somebody, or just go back to the attorney that did it and ask, is is this, does this trust protect uh, my one third share of the home vis a vis Medicaid later on in life? Okay. okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I'd just like to say we really enjoyed the information. Very informative. From oh, every, I'm so glad. From Thank every, you. From that firm. Thank you. Thank you, William and Adam. We appreciate that. Thank you. We had some amazing questions. Again, I'm going to have this on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions or you want clarification or you need a consultation, please either call Mitchell or call Ronald Fatula's office. And uh, you have both of their contact informations in the chat. We will be glad to work with you to answer your questions. Um, if you just want a, a simple question clarified, call us. We'll be glad to talk with you. And it is a difficult time, uh, obviously, for all of us, especially if you're a middle class. It's really crazy with all the changes in Medicare and Medicaid. But please remember that we are both here for you, and we're more than glad to help you in any way we can. Thank you and have a good night. And thanks for all of your great questions. Yeah. Thank right. you for joining us. And Mitch, thank you so much for imparting this very important information smack dab right in the middle right. of open enrollment. So thank you, Mitch.